that? To record a Zoom meeting. I just got Zoom? a notification. It, I just got a notification that it is recording. Can you tell? Oh, okay. All right, let's go then. Okay. Um, sorry, everybody. So as I was saying, my presentation will be about five minutes starting now. Um, and I'll provide a little background information to our audit process, then I'll go into our audit reports. I'm not going to spend much or any time going over the financial statements, and we didn't post any audit adjustments. So the numbers that you see were previously approved with your unaudited actuals, and the numbers are fairly old at this point. We're presenting data from the last fiscal year end. Okay, so as a school district, you're required by the California State Controller's Office to receive an annual audit. And if you have the audit report in front of you, what it actually includes is three separate audit reports or three different opinion letters. I'll go into each of these in more detail, but the first is our independent audit report over the financial statements. The second is our report on internal controls, which is required for all governmental entities. And the third is our report on state compliance and internal controls. We conduct our audit in two main phases. The first phase is what we call the interim audit, and this typically occurs in the spring. During this time, we're focused on internal control and state compliance testing. When we look at internal control, we're testing the design and effectiveness of controls that would prevent, detect, and correct misstatements, whether due to error or fraud, and we're primarily reviewing the processes over receipts, disbursements, and payroll. During this time, we're also focused on state compliance, and all of the state compliant um, audit requirements are outlined in the state audit guide. As you can imagine, last year, there was a heavy focus on distance learning. The second phase of our audit is what we call the year-end audit. This occurs after the board has approved the unaudited actuals. And during this time, we're focused on testing account balances. So all of the numbers that you see, we're looking to tick and tie your cash, recalculate your revenue, and feel comfortable with all the numbers in the financial statement. Throughout the audit, the district and auditors have different responsibilities. So the district is responsible for designing, maintaining effective internal controls, the same ones that I talked about on the last slide. They prepare and really take ownership of the financial statements, and they also prepare and manage their own budget. As an auditor, my responsibility is to provide an opinion. I'm looking to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are materially correct. And I also am responsible for conducting the audit in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States and standards that are applicable to governmental audits. So with that being said, I'll jump into our audit reports. If you have the audit packet in front of you, I think page 62 does a really nice job of summarizing our opinion letters. So our first report can be found on page one. It's our report on the financial statements and we issued an unmodified opinion. Although this sounds a little lackluster, it's the best opinion that you could receive. Our second report can be found on page 57. This is the report over internal controls. There was no material weaknesses identified or significant deficiencies. There wasn't any non-compliance that would be material to the financial statements. The third and final report that we issued can be found on page 59 um, relating to state compliance. Again, we issued an unmodified opinion, the best opinion that you can receive. There were no material weaknesses. However, there were two audit findings, uh, which we've classified as significant deficiencies. The first of those audit findings is number 2021-001, and it relates to classroom teacher salary. This is a finding that the district has year over year um, related to the financial hardship of to meet the minimum requirement of teacher salary. There is no fiscal impact because the district receives a waiver from the County Office of Education. The second finding relates to comprehensive school safety plans. The district is required to develop and approve comprehensive school safety plans by March 1st of the audit year, which wasn't done. As you can see, the district has created a corrective action plan to prevent this from happening in the future. Um, so before I turn it over for any questions, I just wanna say a big thank you. The audit process um, is always cumbersome, especially in a remote environment, and I'm happy to report that it went really smoothly. 
And at this time, I'd be, I'll stop my share screen and I'd be happy to take any questions. So I have a question. Um, before you actually start the audit, do you have discussions with the school management about areas of concern that might have you focusing on those areas uh, in a particular audit? Yeah. So part of our planning phase and that we do at the beginning of the audit is we meet with members of management and then also a member of the board uh, to discuss the audit. We go over kind of the scope of our audit, things that have changed. Our firm specializes in auditing school districts, so we're current on any changes. Um, and so, yeah, we do kind of discuss that as part of our planning and risk assessment. Um, other question too, like when you're planning the audit, what steps do you put in place to detect things like material errors or fraud or illegal activity or weaknesses in internal controls? Are there certain uh, steps that you take to make sure that you can find those things? Yeah, so um, throughout our audit process, we do planning and risk assessment at the beginning of our audit. And then this is also something we revisit throughout the course of our audit. Um, some specific steps that we take are we perform um, legal confirmations, we reach out to your legal counsel, bank confirmations, we have interviews with other um, employees at the district and we ask questions that are specific about fraud. We also develop um, expectations kind of for what we would expect out of district your size and we complete analytic um, ratios and comparisons from prior years and industry standards. Uh, so I think those are some good examples of things we do that would detect misstatements, um, maybe give us some clues into fraud. Um, yes, yeah, so those are all things that we kind of keep in mind throughout the planning and the course of our audit. Uh, when considering weaknesses, uh, material weaknesses, what is the dollar amount of a reporting error that would raise a level? of awareness well a material weakness has more to do that's okay um so material weakness has more to do with um processes so material weaknesses would be a deficiency that would create a reasonable risk that a material misstatement um wouldn't be prevented detected or corrected in a reasonable amount of time um so it isn't necessarily a specific dollar amount we do develop uh, materiality dollar amounts when we're looking at account balances to determine whether audit adjustments would need to be made. Um, but a material weakness is, is really something that's more pervasive um, within the school district and their internal controls. Uh, thank you. And I have one more question. Are there any concerns um, you have about man management's control of key process? No, I think the school district has done a really good job to segregate um, key duties that we look for, um, specifically over things like the payroll process, um, accounts payable. There also are additional controls put in place, such as um, board oversight. I know that you guys review check registers, payroll registers, um, and then also the county oversight that they provide um, for your district are all um, good mitigations of risks that we take into account. Um, when conducting an audit, do you look for transactions or activity that could have the appearance of conflict of interest? Yeah, so we review the Form 700 that board and key management members are required to submit. Um, we also review a list of vendors. And this is also a question that we talk about during those initial audit meetings um, with members of management and then also a member of the board. Do you have any recommendations to offer about organization changes or task assignments that would reduce financial risks or risks of data breaches? Not at this time. Um, you know, the purpose of our audit is really to provide an opinion on the financial statements and that they're materially correct. Um, over the course of our audit, if we identify areas that could be improved, um, we definitely recommend that to the district. But at this time, I don't have any recommendations. 
Um, I know you guys have been doing our audits for a number of years. Are there any unresolved questions left over um, from prior years? No, no unresolved questions. Um, yes, we have been working on your audit for a number of years. This year we had a partner rotation. So we had um, kind of the highest level of eyes um, was a new set of eyes overlooking the audit. Um, but no, no unresolved questions from this year or last. And then um, another question um, specifically because of COVID attendance, um, have you noticed anything regarding um, record keeping that could impact our funding? Well, so for the audit that we just finished, the 2020-2021 audit, the LCFF funding was held harmless. Um, so the, um, I don't have any concerns that would affect the funding for the audit that we just completed. I would recommend and kind of to be aware of that COVID attendance processes have changed from 2020-2021 to the fiscal year that you're currently in. So the, that would end June 30th, 2022. Um, there's no longer really distance learning. All students should be on independent study if they're not in the classroom. Um, so that'd be something to think about for this year. Um, but last year, no impacts of funding that um, I'm concerned about. Hold on just a second again, Lily, because okay. I don't know. I think the YouTube started playing again. Is what it sounds like. It does. All right. I think we're good again. Okay. Yeah. Did I answer your question about the COVID attendance um, sufficiently? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So I have a question regarding um, the PERS and STRS. I'm not sure if you're the person to answer the questions or address them or if Kathy is, but I'm gonna try if you don't mind. Okay. All right. Um, when I was looking at the audited financial statements, I'm looking at pages 47 and 48 where the district has uh, contributed some $752,000 to PERS and STRS. However, in the same period, the uh, district's net pension liability increased by almost $700,000. Um, while a state's net pension uh, liability actually decreased by about $21,000. So how does that happen where the state's goes down and the district's goes up like that. Right, um, so I can take this question. So the net pension liability for the district is calculated on its proportionate share of the state of California's net pension liability. Um, so the state's net pension liability from 2019 to 2020 and stores and purse lags one year behind. So you'll hear me reference a prior year. Um, their net pension liability increased by 6.5 billion dollars and the district's proportionate share of that remains pretty close to steady um, at 0.005 percent um, so the net pension liability is calculated based on the state's total um, and it's all based kind of on actuarial studies that have been audited by a separate firm so i'm not sure if that answers your question but it isn't necessarily your own liability but the state's the district's proportionate share of the state's total liability. So if the burden goes up for the whole state, regardless of what we do here, we get a bigger piece of, of uh, liability because the state's total liability went up. That's correct. So even if the district were to, let's say your liability was a million dollars just for conversation purposes, if the district was to pay a million dollars to the state and say, okay, our we've paid our liability, it should be zero. That isn't quite how it would work. The district would still show a liability on their books equal to their proportionate share of the state's total liability. So that explains why we're not catching up. And That's gonna, correct, yeah. right. Uh, regarding those contributions, are those included on the financial analysis on page six? Yeah, so let me pull up the audit report just so I can speak a little um, more specifically. So the MDNA analysis, the management discussion analysis that you have on page five and page six, those are summaries of the government-wide financial statements. Um, 
So within the audit report, you have the government-wide financial statements and then also the fund financial statements. The district contributions that you referenced, I think it was around 700,000, yeah, 750,000. Um, those contributions are recognized as expenses on the fund financial statements. However, the calculated expense is recognized on the government-wide. Um, so on the government-wide financial statements, there was an expense of about $1.3 million included. So that 1.3 then would be the 700,000 increase plus the 750,000 that we contributed? It's not quite calculated that linearly, um, but there is a difference between um, only the contributions are reported on government funds and then the calculated expense is on the government wide that you're seeing that 1.3 million that I referenced. Okay, so, but the net increase in liability does not show on our balance sheet, does it? Oh, yes, it does. I'm sorry. It is part mm -hmm. of the, uh, okay. When we look at those contributions, both the contributions and the increase in debt, is that considered part of the district expense when calculating the 60% requirement? Mm, that's 60. Answer that. Okay. The, our portion of the state's pension liability and that unfunded liability does not come into the 60% calculation. Only our contributions, our employer contributions, Coosters and PERS come into the 60% calculation. Actual money out the door comes into the 60% calculation. Okay. All right. I understand. Thank you. To piggyback on that question, the um, $537,000 that was sort of the, um, the funding the, gap, the, I think. The funding dollars, the, um, the question costs on page 64. Um, did you see any problems or issues which could be considered as inappropriate spending in, the, um, in other areas? Um, I think that's a little outside of the scope of our audit. Um, I wouldn't feel comfortable answering that, but I don't know if Kathy would want to take that question. I, yeah, um, I don't know about the term inappropriate. I mean, maybe it's more, you know, what shows up in the numerator as a classroom expense versus what's showing up in the denominator of the calculation, which is your total current expenses, classroom expenses, and almost everything else. And, you know, over the years, um, I've looked at, you know, really nitpicking through the expenses as to what should be included and what shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, we did have the opportunity in 2021 to exclude some of the COVID relief grant money that we got as long as we hadn't spent any of it on <coughs> teachers salaries for a particular grant we could exclude it from the calculation completely, um, which did help a little bit, but, you know, we do still have a challenge meeting that requirement as do many districts in the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, I just, um, just from an audit perspective. Yeah. Um, there was a depreciation of, um, oh gosh, on page eight, um, I got to, and I'm just wondering why it, we weren't also, ex, um, why these expenses weren't included on page six. Great. Those um, expenses are included on page six. However, they're allocated by function. So you're not seeing an individual line amount for um, depreciation expense, but it's included within the allocated function. Um, you might find it helpful to review the note on capital assets which I can provide you a page number. That's on page 29. And that will show you how the depreciation expense is allocated. I think it's about 460,000 to transportation and then about 830,000 to plant services. Yes, 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 go ahead. I'm still trying to find 29. 
I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? Yes, is the depreciation part of the expenses shown on page six? Yes. It is. Yes, let me flip to that page. Yeah, so depreciation expense is embedded within this statement, um, but it doesn't have a single line call out, um, but it's grouped within the plant services and pupil services. Thank you. Uh, anybody from the board have any more questions? Okay. I don't. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, would anyone like to motion to accept the 2021 audit report? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make a motion to accept the audit report. Cool. Uh, but before I do that, I want to just emphasize this was a clean audit. Yes. And um, as, uh, as, long, as she mentioned, I forget her name already. <laughs> um, there were three different segments of opinions and all of them were good. There are two areas that we're aware of that we need to work on and we're working on them. So I think this is a good audit and it reflects well on the uh, management of the school. So I move to accept the, uh, the audit report. I'll second that. Are there any um, questions or comments from the community? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much, Lily, for answering all of our questions tonight. Great, we'll, thank you. We'll thank see. you, Lily. I think we'll see Lily again. Um, Christy White is performing the independent audit on general obligation bonds also, which will be prepared in the next month or two. Thank you, Lily. Thanks for your patience. No problem. Have a good night. Challenges. Just a minute.